be turned back north again and again by packers. However, he did sow the seeds of excitement with his vivid reports of ample seal and whale populations. Within 75 years, countries were ushered into the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. Much like the space race of the 1960s, each country had to be the first to explore the icy continent, and reaching the South Pole became a worldwide obsession. Return now to the heart and soul of leadership during this heroic age of exploration, Ernest Shackleton was an Anglo-Irishman with a hunger for polar glory. These are the leadership skills that are as epic today as they were 100 years ago. This is his legacy. At the turn of the century, the competition was fierce to be the first to reach the South Pole and strike a point. The Sixth International Geographical Congress soon declared that developing a better understanding of the Antarctic would be the most urgent scientific issue of the era. Despite a total lack of knowledge and supplies, I willingly joined Robert Scott in his discovery expedition of 1902. Scott and I clashed often over supplies, travel speeds, and routes. There was simply no margin for error. We did not reach our goal, but did succeed in pushing farther south than any previous expedition. Scott virtually blamed me for the failure, and referred to me as the invalid, but this only reinvigorated my own Antarctic ambition. Shackleton did return to the Antarctic, leading the second British team. Despite knowing another country would first reach the pole, he made the difficult decision of turning back just 97 miles from his goal. His leadership with the Nimrod would not sacrifice his men for glory. Two years later, the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen won the race. One month after that, Scott's second expedition also reached the South Pole, but the entire team perished during their return trip, doomed by poor planning, severe hunger, and dejection of having lost the claim to the Norwegians. There remained but one great main objective, the crossing of Antarctica from sea to sea. Securing funding presented major obstacles, as I had developed a reputation of poor health due to a heart ailment. However, I would not let this stand in my way. I resulted in finding funding wherever and at whatever cost. I hired a photographer, Frank Hurley, and sold shares of whatever photos and publications that might result. We promoted this experience as a chance to reestablish the prestige of Great Britain in polar exploration. What makes a leader someone follow despite the overwhelming odds of defeat? Shackleton exhibited the two main great, greatest leadership aspects. Supreme resiliency, meaning his ability to change with the demands of the situation, and servant leadership, by putting the well-being of his followers before himself and other goals. One hundred years ago today, Shackleton's ship, the Endurance, was lodged in the pack ice of the Weddell Sea. The year was 1915. The story that follows is one of courage and optimism met by planning and fortitude. His leadership his legacy. I had supplied my ship and handpicked a crew of scientists, sailors, and officers. These men all had qualities exhibited associated with optimism, personal trait I felt essential. Frank Wilde had been with me on the Nimrod expedition in 1909. I knew he was able to withstand the most difficult mental and physical trials. He volunteered and would be my second in command. But July of 1914, the endurance had ducked and ready for the Antarctic. However, two weeks later, I read in the newspapers that Great Britain had declared war on Germany. I immediately sent a telegram offering to turn the entire expedition over to military effort. I received an immediate reply from the First Lord of Admiralty, Winston Churchill, saying one word, proceed. By the time we arrived on the Stromness Bay whaling station in South Georgia Island, the pack ice was slow to break up, but I was certain that we would leave on schedule. Months later, when the pack ice closed upon the ship, I remained calm and confident to sustain morale and create a unified team. Everyone was equal now. You just might as often find a scientist scrubbing the floor as a sailor or myself. The men took to calling me boss, but I did not myself, nor allow any of my men to receive any preferential treatment. Eventually, the ice flows would win the battle, and the endurance would be lost to the sea. It's a pity, but that cannot be helped. It's the men we have to think about now. Captain Frank Worsley was standing next to me as the endurance was lost to the sea. I said to him, it looks as though we shan't cross the Antarctic after all. The next morning I announced to the crew a new goal. Ship and stores have gone, so now we'll go home. A man must shape himself a new mark directly the old one goes to ground. Our ship was gone, so previous plans were irrelevant. I kept my men's focus on the future, but rest was difficult in wet and frozen sleeping bags. And Patience Camp, the name my men gave to our camp on the ice flows. Because of this, I divided my time among the tents, reciting poetry and playing cards with the men. 
Finally, 15 months after being lodged in ice, I ordered the lifeboats launched in search of land. For seven days, we rowed upon cold and stormy sea, and finally, we landed on Elephant Island. I watched as the men danced along the beach and let the black pebbles dribble through their hands, overjoyed at the first solid land in 497 days. However, food would not last until the whalers returned in the spring. We refitted the lifeboat that James cared to make the voyage back to Strongest Bay Whaling Station on South Georgia Island. I chose five men to go with me on this dangerous voyage, not asking them to do something I would not do myself. Crean, Worsley, and Wilde were obvious choices for their nautical skills, and McNish, as he had been our carpenter who had designed the vessel. After two weeks at sea, our little ship was within 80 miles of the South Georgia coast, but our drinking water and supply had become contaminated, making thirst our worst enemy. We were so parched we couldn't even eat. Because of this, I determined the distance to Stromness Bay Whaling Station too great to risk, so we landed on the uninhabited west coast of the island. We had completed the near impossible of silence, sailing through 800 miles of the world's most turbulent seas, but had yet to cross the uncharted interior of the island, a mere 29 miles, but through a tangle of 10,000 foot peaks and glaciers never before crossed. I had three men remain on the backside of the island, while Crean, Worsley, and I would make the crossing. Finally, after 36 hours without sleep nor shelter, we arrived at the Strongest Bay Whaling Station. I wasted no time in making preparations for the rescue of my men, and finally, on August 30th, 1916, more than two years after the original departure of the Endurance from London, I had completed the most important mission of my life. I had led my men through hell, and every last one had survived the ordeal. We had lived up to the Shackleton family motto, by endurance we conquer. A biographer once called Shackleton, the greatest leader ever to walk God's earth, bar none. Yet he had never led a group larger than 27, failed to reach nearly every one of his goals, and until recently had little been remembered after his death. He is a model of great leadership, a master of guidance in crisis. 100 years later, his survival strategy seems particularly relevant to the high-risk entrepreneurial spirit that characterizes business today. Here at Harvard Business School is one of many institutions that still uses Shackleton's endurance voyage as a means to teach leadership. How did Shackleton take failure and turn it into success? He based his leadership on foundational camaraderie, loyalty, responsibility, determination, and optimism. He was not afraid to change his goal and direction with face with reality. Sixty years after the rescue, a reporter asked the Endurance First Officer Lionel Greenstreet, how did you survive when so many expeditions perished? He responded with one word, Shackleton. His leadership skills reflected the immediate needs of the crew through example and resilience. Shackleton set the bar for leadership so high that 100 years later we still teach by his example. He was, still is, and forever will be one of the world's greatest leaders. Sir Raymond Priestley, early 20th century Antarctic explorer and geologist, is credited with the insight of the leadership and legacy of Sir Ernest Shackleton. For scientific discovery, give me Scott. For speed and efficiency of travel, give me Amundsen. But when disaster strikes and all hope is lost, get down on your knees and pray.
asked if they, because they were only, at one point, they were only 40 miles from the Antarctic coast, and they had supplies set up there. And if they asked, you know, hey, can we go try to make the hike over there? But it was in the middle of the Antarctic winter. It was not. The, many men would have died because of that. They looked at him as their leader, but he was one with them. Um, that, I believe, is the main greatest leadership aspect of how he was not standing above as Scott was. That's how his expedition perished. He was too high above them, but he stayed with them, and if we had not existed, we would have, I believe, too many leaders that were just, you know, I'm important, you go do this My, yourself, I'll stay back and watch, and, and not jumping into it himself. And, and so would you say everybody needs to, um, everybody would be affected if Shackleton did not exist, or is it really explorers and discoverers who go down to Antarctica or people in the nautical industry. Well, most of his legacy, as I exhibited in my performance, were in the Harvard Business School of how they use his expeditions as a way to teach leadership um, and entrepreneurship, how his examples are still used through those and not just exploring. Your research is extensive. What was your most His book, South, was one of the most important, as it was his day-to-day -day, um, journal of it. Uh, he did own all the rights to the journals of all the men. Um, those were extremely helpful. Uh, Frank Hurley's photography was also, and there would have been much more if they had not been trapped, because he was forced to lead by hundreds of slide, glass slides of photographs. But I, they were so important, I used them in my performance. A bunch of tons of biographies on him, of course. Um, he is amazing. So, Mostly his book set. I'm sorry. Oh, you know it. Um, so, does you keep referring to Harvard? Does the School of Business then use that book as a reference? Yes. And how do they incorporate that into their lessons? I believe they have it as a um, mandatory reading. You know, you look through and you find. This is what is best. This is how you teach, or not teach. This is how you exhibit great leadership qualities. And what sources helped you to build that information about how Harvard is specifically using? Um, uh, themselves, there was a professor there. I do not cannot remember her name, but I believe it was in my process paper. And how she says that that professor that she uses examples. 